So welcome to Foundations TV. Today with us, we have got a chief economist of the state of Utah, an economist who have gone outside a usual realm of an economist and used actually big data and technology to make tangible improvements in the state of Utah, number one. Number two, has also taken technology to actually create new policy changes and we are very excited to have David Stringfellow with us in our studio remotely. Welcome to Foundation TV, David. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. So let's get started with the exciting work that you are doing in Utah. I understand you are using big data to do policy changes. Tell us more about what exactly does that mean and how does the chief economist get really involved in the IT technology data stuff? Sure. Uh, my, my background is uh, I, I've used technology in, in large amounts of data to, to do analysis. I worked for the Census Bureau for several years. So I was familiar with uh, SAS and various other types of uh, analytical tools that can help provide uh, data analysis. So I, I came to the state of Utah um, and as an economist I worked for several governors on tax policy and various other types of initiatives to help public policy be more data driven, mm -hmm. more decision oriented. Um, and, and we had early successes in reforming our tax system. And uh, recently, our state auditor, uh, which is an independent position elected by our entire state, uh, he had an idea for pushing the envelope and being the watchdog of government resources, mm -hmm. not just kind of the the, the, the stamp on the public accounts. Mm -hmm. So it, his effort is really to drive efficiency and effectiveness in government. And we do that by having access to any data resource that the state, local governments, universities, uh, counties, anybody that is in government that generates data we have the statutory authority to access that information and analyze it and then try to convince people that they should change policies in certain ways. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a, a difficult uh, task sometimes. Um, we, we take our, our responsibilities of protecting data very seriously. Um, a data breach for us results in felonies, not just bad press. Mm. Uh, for for a retail operation, so mm. we have we have all kinds of, of data from health records, uh, school records of children, uh, university records, uh, all the way to you know what governments spend on police services or roads or, or transit development, and uh, we we spend a lot of money. Uh, you know, twenty percent of the the state. Uh, gross domestic product, twenty billion dollars about goes through the state and uh, local governments. Great. So I understand your intent in terms of making positive policy changes, but at the same time, if I'm a private citizen listening to what you are just saying, I'm concerned because look at the all the press we got from NSA and other government programs going on. If I'm a private citizen, what's the message we communicate to them to ensure their rights are safe and secure, their privacy is intact, while you are impacting the big policy decisions? Yeah, I think that's an important uh, an important point to make with people. Uh, people already think the government knows everything about them anyways. So I think the perception is that government already has all of this information and that they might be using it um, in ways that, that uh, they might not like. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think for our purposes, um, government's been collecting this data for longer than most people have been born. Uh, government has a long history of, of collecting data to administer the programs that they, that they use. So, so we're a, maybe a little bit ahead of the curve uh, than the private sector in creating rules and procedures around using data. Uh, protecting who has access to data and uh, what the permissible uses of those data are. Mm -hmm. And then how do we disclose that type of information? 
or not, in most cases, not disclose it to the public. So what our goal really is to do is to improve operational efficiency of government while protecting uh, private identifiable information from any kind of nefarious use. Okay, so now are you also bound by the standard regulations like HIPAA compliance and other privacy regulations that we have put in place for data security and privacy of our end users? Uh, yes, we, we uh, federal law applies to us in many cases because we're involved in federal programs, mm -hmm. so we protect our data in those ways. Mm -hmm. HIPAA compliant, FERPA compliant, there's a long list of uh, data compliance I'm sure. um, matters that we we're aware of and that we implement in our in the design of our IT systems and in the ultimate use of the data as it as it goes through the process of trying to help improve government efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, so can you take some examples of your most recent projects where you have actually used this big data and to make a positive policy change for your residents? Sure. Uh, I think uh, one of the recent uses that we, we applied that was a, a great success uh, involved the administration of our food assistance program mm -hmm. uh, from the federal government. Uh, in Utah, we have uh, about $400 million uh, flow through the state of Utah uh, to help assist citizens with purchasing food. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 100,000 um, uh, res uh, households in the mm -hmm. state, and they have about uh, they have a little bit over uh, a million transactions a month that they uh, take what looks like a credit card and they swipe it at a store to pay for eligible food items. And one problem that uh, we've seen in that program is that there's uh, the potential for fraud, waste, and abuse. Yep. And organized crime tries to use this to their advantage to steal the benefits. Um, and, and, and pay the people who are uh, consuming the benefit, um, you know, 50 cents on a dollar or something, mm. so that they both walk away with some of that money. Mm -hmm. And that's clearly against the terms of the assistance. And so what we did was we took those um, 30 million records and started analyzing the transaction patterns, mm -hmm. like any c credit card company right, does, right. to check for fraud. Um, you know, sometimes you'll be trying to check out and buy that new computer at Staples and you'll find, you know, they're calling you on the phone asking you, is this really you trying to buy this item at Staples and you can approve the transaction? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're trying to apply in some of those same cases some of these predictive analytics to flag um, potential fraud transactions from occurring. Mm -hmm. And then we worked with our attorney general and our office and the federal office of inspector general to try to insert these analytics into the operation of the program that haven't been in the past so that we can better capture the fraud and use that money for the purpose it was intended. And ultimately that reduces the cost. I think if the federal government implemented this type of pro, uh, process of analytics in the, in the SNAP program, um, we, we've seen maybe a, an immediate $5 million annual savings to a $400 million program. Uh, the federal government spends $70 billion on this every wow. year, affecting 30 million households. Mm -hmm. So these analytics could go a long way to improving the program nationally, saving maybe a billion dollars a year. So basically what I'm getting at a very high level is you have actually demonstrated that using the data, you can effectively use the government budget at a state level. Extrapolate that to a federal level, we are talking of huge amount of savings that everybody can reap benefits of. Right, right. And, and there's always going to be expected fraud, but yeah. uh, as, as people you know, adapt to the new tools, uh, credit card companies have, have deployed a wide range of analytical tools to help catch fraud before it occurs. Right, right. And we could do the same thing, I think, in, in these national programs right. to help improve their effectiveness. So what you are doing as a chief economist, playing with the data, is that a usual role of a chief economist or you are an outlier in this whole group of chief economists in other states? Sure. It, it's a bit of a new experiment, um, I would say. Uh, 
I have a, a background in, in data analytics and uh, building simulation models. Uh, so, so economists do a lot of data science, I think, these days in general, mm -hmm. in business and in other places, uh, because of the way that we're trained to think um, is, is helpful in uh, data analytics in the new field, emerging field of data science. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in, in a government role, I'm, it's probably a unique experiment. Um, there are some other uh, cities, counties, towns that I'm aware of who are engaging in some of these types of initiatives to help data drive better policy decisions. Um, but it is kind of a new uh, way of looking at things. So if that's such a new way of looking at things, can you tell us more about when you started this new endeavor, how was the reaction from your peers or co-workers and you said, you know what, guys, let's look at the data and look, analyze it. How was the reaction to that if you are as such an advanced and forward thinker? Sure. I, I think sometimes, um, you know, there's hesitancy uh, by some groups to change the way they've done things in the past mm -hmm. and to have data drive some decisions rather than uh, people's gut feel or have history or inertia drive those decisions. Mm -hmm. So, Sometimes it is a tough sell um, to have and bring in data analytics to try to change how people operate. Uh, one example is uh, we run a large wholesale retail operation for the distribution of alcohol in our state. It's about a $400 million a year business, and we actually set up stores. We have employees that staff them. And we have to manage the supply chain of all of this liquor, mm -hmm. and we build warehouses to store it. And so we, we we went in and looked at their data and said, you know, there there might be better processes for demand forecasting and for applying um, some of the new analytical techniques in supply chain management to our processes mm -hmm. to better um, align your ordering patterns with what you actually are. Um, selling to customers mm. and I think that was kind of a new um, way of approaching it in their business model that really wasn't uh, it was more of a relationship based model where we're suggesting more of a, a data driven mm. model in, mm. in making some of those decisions and so it takes a little bit of convincing you have to sometimes convince legislators and uh, you have to convince in a public forum people to change the way that they've done things in the past. Um, luckily, the data generally backs up the story that you're telling. Um, some people cry foul sometimes, but it's part of a process of trying to integrate better management of resources and the data resources that we have to leverage them to, to tell important stories that aren't biased so that we can make better decisions. Excellent. And I think people do embrace that once they see that it's a fair process. Right. That it's you know people aren't out to get the administrations, the bu the bureaucracy of various agencies. It's just a method of improving the way we operate. But I'm sure people would have initial shock when they see the data in front of them that you cannot refute. <laughs> <laughs> it it can be a shock, um, uh, but we try to take people through that process yeah. in a way that. Uh, up front, you know, they're kind of inoculated against some yep. of the shocks, and they can, they can, they can move through the analysis um, okay. with us. Great. But it is a new way of operating, and, and sometimes uh, people disagree with the analysis, and they start to perform their own analysis given their data resource. And I think that's even uh, a great outcome sometimes, Absolutely. even if it doesn't drive a change. It's changed the way that we talk about right. making decisions. Absolutely. So how do we take your thought, your accomplishments, your successes in Utah and take them to a national level? You know, I was at a conference uh, last month in Boston and I ran into an old colleague at the Census Bureau and the Under Secretary of Commerce gave this presentation about how the Census Bureau should um, try to better use uh, their data resources to um, track the economy mm -hmm. and 
the Census Bureau sends out lots of surveys to lots of businesses, and that can be a drain on resources, on accounting staff, yeah. filling out government forms. And I think there's a, a, a lot of opportunity for us to, to look at the way that we do these operations. And there's a lot of room for improving the way that we do data collection and then the, and the way that we use that data so that we can streamline the way that we've done things in the past and maybe eliminate a lot of you know, paper forms or seeming busy work. I think we really have to have a discussion about um, in that process how we use the data and, and what what is private, what's protected, what's public use, uh, what's information that anybody can access. So I think there's there's ways that we can we can move forward in, in, at the federal government level, mm -hmm. at the state level, at the local level mm -hmm. to try to use the resources that we have in, in this massive pile of, of administrative data that we have collected for a hundred years. Yep. And that we're continuing to collect, and it's just exploding. Um, how we can really use it appropriately to help make government work better and more efficiently, so that we can. Um, I, I like to say that you know, government will waste a lot more money than people will ever steal from it, committing fraud. So efficiency is is kind of the science of economics. Yeah. And I think that's how we can leverage new data resources with appropriate privacy protections to help decision makers have full, full and better information right, right. when they decide to do things. Like, do we hire the next cop? Yep. Do we need another mile of road? Does building this bridge actually make sense? Yep. And it's not just a, you know, a, a vote that's tacked onto the end of a bill, but it's something that we can actually discuss and make a case for in a way that is somewhat um, somewhat neutral. Yep. That we don't have to always fight about, you know, is this a political thing or is it not? We can sometimes just let the data speak right, and hope absolutely. that it helps drive some decisions. Absolutely. Well, very well said. And with that, I'd like to wrap up the interview today and. Thank you so much for your time to talk about your initiatives and I hope your thought process, your successes are replicated throughout the country. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.